Welcome. I think we're live. This is Speed at the bottom of the helix. And today we have an avid prototype modeler focusing on the New Haven Railroad in Connecticut between 1946 and 1954. He's been documenting his layout for the last decade at newbritainstation.com. So you're welcome to hop over there and read everything he wrote down. He also has a decade of experience in model rail, uh, oops, experience in model training manufacturing, and he's also the owners of Prototype Johnson, a new company working on crowdfunded model trains. Welcome to Mr. Randy Hamill. Thanks, Speed. So how is everybody doing out there? It's been a, another great day of clinics, it looks like. Uh, I've been enjoying these this uh, spring and going into the summer here. Um, so I will get my presentation up here and uh, get going. Let's see if I can find it. All right, so today I'm going to be talking about operations and kind of how I'm designing operations for my layout. Um, like everything I do, this is kind of my approach to things and uh, everybody's going to have their own sort of unique uh, needs and approach to their layout. But uh, I'm hoping this will give you guys something to think about and um, maybe some ideas you can use on yours. So uh, the approaches to designing operations are kind of how I approach it is I don't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, doing uh, this based on prototype practices. Uh, a lot of times we start with uh, existing model railroad operations practices, and I kind of like to start with the prototype and work my way backwards. Uh, but I do learn from a lot of other model railroad operating approaches and designs that people have used on their layouts. Uh, you know, what do you like? What do you don't like? Uh, how does that differ from the prototype? That sort of thing, so that you can kind of narrow in what um, the focus and approach that you like to operate on your model railroad uh, and certainly operating on other railroads uh, can help with that a lot uh, and so you can determine what you want for your operations um, to me operations are a model two uh, we you know model all different aspects of uh, railroads whether it be the equipment the scenery structures uh, but uh, the operations themselves are also a model um, and so I start looking at kind of four different aspects of prototype operations, uh, the movement of cars, uh, the movement of trains, the jobs performed by the railroad, and then the paperwork used by the railroad. And different operating schemes um, will use some or all of these in some degree or another, and they are all interrelated. So when you're working on one, you'll, you'll naturally do some aspects of uh, others, but you don't necessarily need all of them as uh, we'll see as we go through this. So uh, just to kind of give a brief idea of what I mean by those. So the movement of cars, there's different approaches that go from simple to complex. Uh, the most basic would be you just pull one car and spot a car when you come to an industry. Car cards and waybills are a very popular way of uh, handling movement of cars on model railroads. You can use computer programs to uh, design that, uh, and they're usually focused on the car card and waybill approach um, and can get fairly complex. Take a quick look at the car cards and waybills uh, systems, though because this is the most common approach. Car cards themselves are not prototypical. Um, it was designed for modelers, uh, by modelers, and it was designed around the idea of where you, you know where every car is and what the next movement of the car is going to be. So it's usually a little um, pocket, a card of uh, card stock with a pocket in it, and then you put a little waybill in it, and you can rotate that waybill uh, between two different or four different industries, depending on how you do it. Uh, nowadays, there's different approaches using like a, a baseball card sleeve for the car card, and then you just slide the waybill inside, different things like that. Uh, computerized versions in particular need to know where the car is at all times. On the prototype, the waybills, though, actually serve two different functions. Uh, they're for routing and, and knowing where the car is going to go, but it's also an accounting form. Um, and so those waybills don't actually go to the industries. They stay with the railroad once the car has been delivered. Um, so they are a little different than the way we use them. And if you're researching the use of waybills, you'll find that there's a lot more information in accounting manuals and stuff than uh, 
the manuals for uh, crews and stuff uh, like the book of rules. Um, one of the first approaches was the car card and waybill system uh, to design something that was more prototypically based. Uh, so it's it's a great starting point. Uh, it's often the only approach to operations. I've operated on a lot of railroads where the only operation uh, is your stack of waybills and you go from industry to industry working the railroad. There might be a schedule of trains or the uh, superintendent owner of the railroad might just send trains out at various intervals. Uh, and so this can be a way to get started on, on operations. But by itself, it does often lack prototypical uh, fidelity. So what's missing from that, if, I, if I'm saying that's lacking some of that fidelity? So you can start with the movement of trains. Uh, sequential movements is a common approach. You know what trains are going to be running because they do run on a schedule typically. And so you just send them out throughout the session. Uh, you might time it to real time. You might do it based on what the activity on the railroad is at the time and so on. Uh, but there's a lot of people that are involved in things like timetable and train order or track warrant systems. Um, uh, both very popular depending on the area you're modeling, as well as signaling systems, as we've just seen. And the signaling systems interact with the other operation uh, systems that the, the railroad uses. So, for example, modeling the New Haven in my era, timetable and train order is the system that they used. Uh, but New Britain is also an automatic block signaling territory. So that uh, impacts the way the train orders might uh, be used. Um, timetable and train order is particularly popular on transition era single track mainline because there's a lot of activity needed to uh, issue orders and so on so that the trains will run smoothly and, and have proper meets and so on. Uh, fast clocks are an optional thing to add. They can improve the experience because there are rules operationally that are based on the schedule and you would need the, the time to know what the schedule is. Um, if you're following prototype practices for the movement of trains, especially when you're combining with a car movement system like uh, car bills and way bill, uh, car cards and waybills, it really can make a, a very prototypical uh, operating system. But there are opportunities to to kind of uh, bring it a little closer to how the prototype operates. So. Uh, jobs performed by the railroad. What do I mean by this? Well, the engineer and conductor are the obvious ones. Um, uh, my friends and I like to run with two-man crews uh, on our railroads. Uh, so you have an engineer and a conductor uh, doing the work. The conductor, the one typically determining what uh, they will do to perform the work, how they're going to uh, sort their train or how they're going to deliver or pick up the cars that they're dealing with. And the engineer is usually the one moving the train. Other layouts might have a dispatcher like we've just seen again. Um, depending on the layout, uh, you may have a yard master. If you have a large yard, they may be responsibility for other jobs. Uh, you might have hostlers and so on, uh, moving the locomotives to engine servicing, that sort of thing. So these are represent uh, a good representation of uh, yard or other jobs that you might have on the railroad besides just the engineer and conductor. We often combine them in, uh, just for simplicity's sake. Obviously, we don't need the army of clerks and so on that the real railroad actually uses or used back in the day. Um, a lot of layouts don't do much beyond the engineer and conductor. Again, with a car card and waybill system and that, you don't often need a dispatcher uh, beyond just the owner telling you, yes, you can move or, or you need to stay on that siding. And not all jobs are going to be needed, obviously, for every layout. So the paperwork used by the railroad um, is an area where there seems to be a lot more interest over the last uh, maybe decade or so, waybills in particular. I've, uh, there's been a lot of uh, discussion about uh, designing more prototypical waybills, even if you're using miniaturized version. Uh, Tony Thompson did a whole series or a continuing series of those on his blog. Uh, Tony Custer's done some articles uh, that are using similar approaches. Um, and so that's one area. Switch lists are something that a lot of people use. The real railroad would use these because uh, the way bills are an accounting form and very important. So uh, uh, conductors would sometimes write out switch lists. Usually it was done by an agent or something, but the switch lists are another one. Train orders, obviously, if you're using timetable and train orders, um, 
can be real important for what you're doing. And uh, there are forms that you can purchase from Micromark and all that look like uh, traditional uh, Form 19 or Form 31 train orders uh, and so on. Uh, there seems to be this trend, as I said, towards more prototypical paperwork. And practical considerations will often impact what we decide to do. There was an awful lot of paperwork that is performed by the real railroads that we really don't need for our modeling. So that's kind of an overview of sort of the areas that I'm going to touch on today. Uh, and uh, this will be kind of a high level overview of these things due to the time. And I'm working on some independent uh, clinics. And obviously, I'm always posting stuff on my blog and uh, website about how I'm approaching this, where I can get into a lot more detail. Uh, but my goals are to really make the operators feel like they're actually working on the railroad. Um, so the focus is a little bit different than some of the uh, the other starting points, I guess. I, I want to simulate all four of those aspects of prototype operations. Uh, I want to learn more about it. That's something I've been doing a lot of research on. I really enjoy it. I've got a lot of uh, actual source material, rule books, paperwork, and so on. Uh, part of the process is to teach others. Doing a clinic like this is a, is a lot of fun for me, and I enjoy doing this or roundtables or just uh, chatting with people and uh, email or at shows and stuff, but I also want to teach through the through the operations themselves when you're operating the layout. Um, it really should kind of uh, teach you something about the way the railroad is running. Um, and I also want a flexible system because I intend to have regular operating sessions for uh, people from out of town as well as my friends. We have uh, a number of train shows in the area and I tend to run operating sessions prior to those. Uh, when I can. I want to be able to tailor it to the specific operators, their skill levels, their interest levels. They may not be interested in all of the, the paperwork and, and uh, things like that. So uh, it needs to be something that can be uh, tailored to that specific situation. Um, because the focus is more on the experience of the operators, how not, not their skill set, but how they experience the operating session when they're here, um, it's less focused on the movement of cars and trains because that's handled really by the job and the paperwork. Um, if you focus on those two things, the, the rest of it kind of takes care of itself. Um, so how am I approaching that? So for the movement of cars, there's no car cards. Um, I can include all the information that might be on a car card, the car uh, road name and number on the waybills like they were prototypically not delivering way bills to industries. So there aren't uh, bill boxes at every industry to determine your work. Instead, uh, most of the car movement process is addressed by learning the other aspects, uh, as I mentioned here. So uh, as we get into the jobs and so on, you'll see how that, uh, that functions. Um, you don't need a really complex system uh, to feel realistic. There's a difference between what you know about your layout and what your operators will know. And unless you have the same operators doing the same jobs every time, um, a, a cycle of three or four, uh, like the old uh, car card and way bill system, is really not a bad approach. It, uh, it's random enough that people aren't going to notice the movement, um, even though you might, because it's your layout and you realize that this car is going between four different places. And you can, you can get more complex by the uh, operators when they're they're uh, actually working on your railroad. Um, the way bills on the prototype, only loaded cars have a way bill. There are exceptions. So empty tank cars were always on a way bill uh, as well. Um, other ones, if they're in special service, might go back on a way bill rather than uh, something like an empty car card. Uh, a common approach that people use is they include a way bill too that's not entirely prototypical. There were different forms that were used for empty cars um, and in some cases no forms. Um, so if we're not using the, the traditional car card and way bill system, how do we know what cars are loaded or empty uh, and which ones are ready to pick up? Um, the traditional approach is you would start uh, at an originating yard or staging or whatever, and you would stop at every industry and you check the, the bill box uh, and you check your paperwork to see if you're doing work. But that's not really how the railroad operates. They only stop when they need to. They don't stop at every industry along the way. 
uh, unless there's work to be done. So in order to answer that, we're going to have to look a little bit more about how the railroad operates. Um, so movement of trains covers some of that. Um, passenger trains obviously run on a schedule. Fast clocks provide that context. So if you're uh, not using a fast clock, um, there's some things that will have to come in play some other way. But a fast clock gives you a, a time where your crew is working other trains, whether it's switching crews in a yard or, or local freights, through freights and so on. They'll know when uh, the, the first class or passenger trains are coming through. Um, Freights typically operate, well, they, they do operate on a, on a set of a schedule, but they also have sort of a pattern to their schedule. So typically, because railroads are trying to get foreign cars off their road at midnight, uh, right after midnight, they're building new trains that are going to deliver cars to their railroad. And so the morning trains typically are running from that originating interchange point to their most distant point, and they're delivering cuts of cars on the way. Um, and a lot of those happen overnight. And then the reverse happens in the evening where afternoon and evening trains are picking up cuts of cars and taking them to the uh, interchange yards to get them off the railroad so they don't have to pay a per diem fee to have those cars there another day. So that pattern kind of helps design the layout uh, operations if you know where you are in relation to the interchange yards. Um, in New Britain, it's uh, there's two locally assigned switching crews, so they actually do all the work spotting and picking up cars. Um, local freights don't do any work in town other than to drop off or pick up cuts of cars, just like the other through freights. The switchers uh, also classify the outbound cars, so when you're sending outbound cars, they have to follow certain rules and uh, they have to be blocked following those rules. Uh, also, there's uh, uh, Stanley Works is the biggest industry in town in New Britain, and they have their own switcher and crew. They have their own locomotive uh, for their plant. Uh, steel industries and other, there's a lot of industries that uh, you might have on your railroad that might have their own switch crew and be sort of their own little railroad on their, uh, their particular piece of property. Um, timetable and train order, like I mentioned, the New Britain is in automatic block territory. It's also a double track main line. So uh, since they all operate on a schedule, um, except the local freight, there's really not much in my case to, to need uh, to write out train orders, not much for timetable and train order stuff at all. So I don't really need a dispatcher. Um, but I do need to uh, pay attention to one rule in particular, and that's the yard limit rule. Uh, this is a rule that I think a lot of people ha are, are confused about, and it's, it's pretty important here because the entire layout is in yard limits. So first off, yard limits are not a stop sign. Uh, I've operated on a lot of layouts where they'll have yard limit signs, and the, the, the rule on the layout is that you must stop at the yard limit sign and then wait until the yard master gives you permission to come into the yard. That's not really how the railroad operates. Uh, you need to design a, an inbound track on your yard, but more importantly, you need to design your schedule around maintaining the, that track and keeping it empty so that inbound trains have some place to go. Uh, so that's one of the most important jobs that the uh, yard crew has is to move the cars out of that and then start working the cars in the yard as they classify them. Um, so that's that's one big thing that's that's really different. The other aspect is that the actual yard limit rules apply to the main track or the main line and not the yard tracks. Uh, so we look at some of these rules. A yard is defined as a system of tracks uh, that's not uh, uh, where movements are not authorized by train timetable or train order. So basically, you can do anything you want on the yard tracks uh, without having to talk to the dispatcher. Um, if you're a yard switching crew, obviously you need to talk to your yard master because they're the ones that are giving you your work. But otherwise, you don't need any special permission to do your movements. The yard limit rule is, um, or the yard rule itself, is about the main line. So the main track can be used without protecting against any other train except for regular scheduling trains. And regularly scheduled trains would be your first class trains typically. And in most railroads, that's just your passenger trains. 
Um, having said that, the railroad expects that the through freights are going to move on their schedules as well. So you really need to make sure you're not blocking them. But the reason why this is important is because passenger trains will be coming through at their normal speed, whatever the speed limit is within your area. In New Britain, that's 40 miles an hour until you reach just before Elm Street, and then it comes down to 20 miles an hour. Um, so your passenger trains are coming in at 40 miles an hour just before they reach the station. Um, but all other trains, uh, whether it's a freight, a local freight, or just engines running light, must run at yard limit speed or yard speed um, when they're within yard limits. So uh, the, you don't have to protect against any of them, and you don't have to be off the main line uh, when they're due through, uh, provided you can let them through when they're supposed to. There are a few other rules here that deal with specific exceptions as to when you may need to protect uh, 93A and B, uh, but we'll look at 105, which talks about yard limits uh, and yard speed. And what that basically is, a speed that will permit stopping within half the range of vision. So in a model railroad, that's not a very useful uh, thing because we have a, you know, we can often see the whole layout. In my case, you can see from one end to the other. Um, so you need to, to think more in terms of the momentum that you have on your locomotive and how fast you can go and still stop without hitting whatever the uh, obstruction, another train and so on is, is operating. Put things into a context as well, which is nice. Um, there is this rule that tells you what the different speeds are and, and he's collected the ones that are in different locations there. But for a model uh, railroad, really what you can narrow it down to or, you know, the, the rule itself is you can make it real simple and say you have to clear the main line 15 minutes prior to the next scheduled, probably passenger train. Otherwise, if you're in yard limits, you can do whatever you need to to do your work without asking permission from the dispatcher. And that's a that really helps on a bigger layout uh, when you set up yard limit areas uh, because you won't be spending as much time talking to the dispatcher. And especially if you're doing something like timetable and train order where they're writing out uh, train orders, uh, it's it's good to, to minimize the amount of contact with the dispatcher. So other roles that might be uh, on your layout, the engineer is the easiest job on the layout. And I'm using a system where I have qualified and unqualified operators. So unqualified operators would be new operators on the layout um, or operators that haven't operated and learned a specific job on the layout. And um, so that just lets people come and run the trains without having to worry about knowing where everything is and how to do the work on it. One thing though that uh, I think is important is the engineer is also responsible for remembering what the ground crew is doing. A lot of people don't take into consideration how the ground crew actually functions. And so how the engineer runs the locomotive in relation to that really adds to the realism of the, uh, the, and the feel of the operations. And I'll, I'll get into the ground crew a little bit more in a moment. Um, the conductor on the other hand owns the job and the work. So they're going to determine how to complete the work they're given. The switch list will tell them that these cars need to be delivered, these cars need to be picked up or moved or what have you, but the conductor is going to determine what moves they're going to use to do that. Um, they are also responsible for blocking the outbound trains. Um, if another train is picking up uh, or even if they're building their train, they, they usually need to be blocked in a certain way for when they reach their, their terminal. Um, one of the things with the conductor in terms of how to complete the work uh, is also going to be related to the ground crew here, and I'll, I'll get into that momentarily. Um, this is something where I'm going to use qualified operators for the conductors. And so the idea behind qualified and unqualified here is that on a real railroad, the same people do the same job every day. Uh, you have to be qualified. In other words, you learn that section of the railroad. You have to pass a test on whatever special rules apply to that part of the railroad. And then you know the, the railroad in that area. You know where every industry is. You know how many cars each track can uh, take, what types of cars they might get, and all that sort of stuff. 
Um, and so I want to try and replicate that on the railroad where you have the operators themselves uh, become qualified. And then they're the ones that are kind of teaching the new crews, the engineers, typically the unqualified operators, the layouts so that they can then perform these jobs later on instead of me being responsible for uh, always being the, the primary source of answers. Um, on my layout, a dispatcher is not really needed um, because it's signaled uh, or will be in a double track main and it's all within yard limits. Uh, we really just need to know what the signals and the yard limit rules um, say to be able to operate uh, with that and know the schedule. So the ground crew is uh, something that I've found very interesting. I've actually been able to operate on a few prototype railroads with some friends that uh, work on the railroad. And the ground crew does a lot of work. Now, we, we don't typically model it, and we really, there's a lot of it that you can't easily model, but it should inform the way we operate the railroad. And what I mean by that is that um, switches are often thrown by hand, and they're usually locked on the layout. Now, you can put locks on your um, fascia so that you can do that, and I've seen a lot of modelers do that. I'm going to have the mainline switches locked like that. Um, and uh, you won't be able to um, lock them until they are closed and, and lined for the main line. Uh, so that's something that takes the ground crew time, but they also have to connect the air hoses. They close or open the valves when they're making moves. Um, they're gonna have to set and release handbrakes uh, when doing so. And they also will often use wheel chop. The engineer will back the train, uh, the cars into a, a, a side track, and uh, the first thing you got to do is put down the skate. Then they back up just a little more because they actually back onto the skate. Once that's set, then you're going to close the valve on the air hose, um, usually on just the train. But if you're going to pick up the car again, like if you're dropping a caboose on the main line, you'd also close it on the caboose so you don't have to pump up the air as much. Um, and then set the handbrake uh, before the locomotive is going to pull away and split the train. So a lot of times you'll see modelers, they'll just back up a train, use their skewer, pull the train away, and you're done. But you don't have to set a specific time, but just think in terms of you're going to back up the train, you're going to have to set the handbrake, open it up, and then you're going to pull away. And it takes a little time to do that job. Um, and that's, that's kind of what I like to, to think about when doing it. Uh, another aspect of that is the, the order in which you do the work. Um, so if you have several industries that are nearby each other, you're more likely to go and pull all of the cars from those industries and then spot whatever cars need to go to each industry because it's actually less work for the ground crew than it is to do one car at a time where you're going to pull one, then spot one, then pull one, then spot one, because there's a lot more um, work that has to go with all of the, the air hoses, setting brakes, and all that sort of stuff. Um, two other jobs that I need on my layout are the yard master, which assigns the work to the switching crews. Um, but there's not enough work on the yard master for my layout. I actually have two yards on the layout, um, but I've combined them with a station agent position. And the station agent is really the person that would handle all of the way bills and the paperwork in town. And the agent is the one that prioritizes the work for the switching crew. So industries would call the agent and say, hey, I've got two cars ready for a uh, pickup. Or I, I, they'd request empty cars and say, okay, I'm going to need an empty car. They'd actually have to tell them where the car is going, um, what the lading would be and all that, because they need to select the appropriate car for that. Uh, and the industry would also often have, and they still do often have uh, specific requirements. Uh, they might want to be switched by 8.30 in the morning, or they might have uh, a specific car that came in on the train and uh, they want that car to be switched out, but the other ones can wait until later and that sort of thing. Um, so the station agent is also the one that's preparing the switch list for the switching crews. Uh, now, like I said, the switch list is just a list of the work that needs to be done, but the, the conductor is actually going to take that and decide how to do that work itself. So on the railroad, there's a whole bunch of things a small town agent is actually responsible for. Uh, the station premises, most of these are 
accounting and reporting things. They they fill out an enormous number of reports on a daily basis, uh, as well as weekly and monthly, um, for doing all these. But they're responsible for all of the work that happens in their town. It's which is actually called a station that denotes the the town itself. Um, so they need to know when cars are spotted how long they've been spotted because they collect emerge charges if they're there for more than 48 hours, um, whether they're loaded, empty, and so on. And so there's a lot of things that they are responsible for. Um, and we don't often have a job like this on a model railroad. But in my case, since it's all within yard limits, uh, the agent performs all of these duties um, that they can then uh, provide the work for the crews. So on my layout, they have a desk, uh, just like a dispatcher would, um, and they're going to perform the jobs of they receive all the inbound way bills, they receive requests for cars and requests to pick up cars from industries, they prioritize that and write out the switch list for the switching crews. Um, and this goes on throughout the session. So there's uh, cars that are set out at the beginning of the day, uh, that are left overnight, but then there's also cars that may come in during the session and they've got to manage all that work as well as requests that I as the owner will tend to provide from the industries themselves. Uh, and I am setting up a phone system to do that as well. Um, they prepare the waybills for the outbound train. So since I don't actually have them typing up waybills, these waybills will be already pre-written. Um, but the outbound trains, they will assemble all the waybills and, and have those for the crews when they pick up the uh, outbound trains. Um, the paperwork used by the railroad, there's a lot of paperwork that the railroad used. In my case, there's four primary types of paperwork that are important for running the railroad. Um, so the first one is the daily check of cars uh, on the real railroad. This had to be completed by 7 a.m. And this told you every car at every sidetrack in the yard, wherever they were at your station, uh, your switching area, whatever it might be. And um, also their status, whether they're loading, unloading, empty, and so on. This was largely for um, accounting purposes but it can also be helpful in the agent thinking or understanding what work they might have that day. Uh, if they know a car is empty, then most likely that's gonna be pulled today. If a car is loading or unloading, it may or may not finish during the day. So they may be, they need to be prepared to uh, potentially do some additional work there. Um, in the morning, I might have the switching crews act as clerks. Um, if they're not running a train at that point in time, they may be f uh, filling this daily check of cars. Uh, partially because it helps spread the work around, but also it'll serve as sort of an orientation for the layout. They'll be able to see where the industries are, remind them what uh, what's there and, and help them plan their work because they'll be able to see what, what work they think they may have as well. Uh, Waybills obviously are a really important thing on my layout as well. Um, I started really looking at designs that Tony Thompson was doing, Tony Custers are similar to these. Um, Inbound cut of cars will be in the bill box. The agent will pick them up in the morning. Outbound waybills, like I said, will be right pre-printed since they won't be typing. And I started with the uh, baseball card size ones um, that a lot of people are using nowadays. Uh, I then determined that, well, I don't really need them to be that small since I'm sitting at a desk. So I did half size waybills, uh, but now I've decided that I'm just gonna do full size paperwork. There's really no reason not to. Uh, since the agent is able to sit at a desk and do all the work right there, um, just like the real railroad. Um, the advantages of the full-size waybills, aside from being prototypical, they're obviously easier to read for folks. They're bigger. Um, they're easy to carry. Um, you can fold them in half and stick them in a pocket just like the prototype, but for the most part, my crews don't need to carry them around, and they don't because they are with the agent. Uh, it also discourages the sorting and working at each industry uh, and on the layout itself. Uh, I'm not a fan of laying out uh, car cards and waybills around the layout. In some cases, depending on how the layout's designed, you don't have an option. Um, but I've provided uh, desks or workspaces for all the crews so that they can deal with their paperwork. Um, but what about if you're running a, a layout where you are following a train? So like instead of having a switching layout, 
and you have uh, a local freight that's working uh, the towns along the lines. Um, you can have desks, workspaces, and key locations like I, I do on mine. Uh, some of them are just large shelves that are under the layout that give them a space to spread out their paperwork. In other cases, they're actual desks. Uh, another thing I've uh, looked at as a possibility and suggested to some folks is a rolling cart. Uh, my buddy Chris Adams has rolling carts where he's got drawers full of freight cars. Um, and we use it as a little desk in a couple of places, but you could actually move it around the layout with you uh, and use it as basically the caboose desk uh, that the conductor would have. Um, and the conductor would work in chunks. So um, when I worked on the, when I've worked on these prototype railroads, in many cases, they do all of their planning before they even leave their, well, they just have a shack, but before they get on the locomotive and go do their work for the day, they know what inbound cars are down waiting for them in Hartford. They know what cars are going to be switched and removed from um, the Home Depot distribution center. And so they plan all that ahead of time. But on a local freight, the conductor would do that in the caboose before leaving the prior town, as well as on the way to the next town. So that once you get to town, you know what you're going to be doing. So on a model railroad, if you have a, a rolling cart, then while the engineer is getting the train put together and ready to come back and continue for to the next town, the conductor can be moving ahead with uh, their rolling cart and looking at the work that they have to do in the next town, getting the way bills and so on if they wanted to do that. Otherwise, the train would come into town and pick up the way bills for work uh, as well as the switch list for work in that town when they get to the station. So um, it gives you some opportunities to do things more like the railroad does. There's some other special way bills. Here's one example. So this is a merchandise way bill. It's actually uh, printed on cardstock. It's about half the width of a normal way bill. The way this worked is that uh, normally LCL freight, they have to have a way bill for each um, shipment. So you have a car that might have 20 different shipments from the two down here, and those would be uh, often shipped ahead of the train so that the freight agent would have those before the car even arrives. And so the way bill, this merchandise way bill, would stay with the car uh, as it moved uh, across the country, or at least across your railroad. Uh, well, no, they would follow it through the country. So uh, that's one example of special way bills, but it's still uh, a way to bring in more prototypical paperwork and a feel for what it is. were used and attached to every way bill when it was brought onto the railroad and it would stay with the way bill. And then when it, the car was delivered to a town, the agent would file the way bill and these would be filed in order so that when the car was ready to be pulled as an empty, the empty uh, home route card would go with it in lieu of a way bill. Um, but cars on the New Haven that were bound for direct connections, so the Erie at Maybrook or l &E at Maybrook, o w or Pennsylvania at Greenville, for example, um, did not use a home route card or a way bill. Those empty cars did not have any paperwork with them. They just moved with the train. Um, so that adds some interesting um, work to for the agent. Um, and then, the, like I said, the through trains, when they pick up, they'll get a stack of way bills, but they're not going to do any work with it other than just to take the way bills. Um, if the car is loaded, then they just throw out the home route card because it now has a new way bill and this card is no longer needed. Um, so the switch lists on mine are a switching requests. So these were used in switching districts or yards and so on, as opposed to a bigger switch list that would have been used by a road freight or a local freight. Um, so the information from the daily check of cars and the way bills, as well as calls throughout the day, is what the agent will use for determining what needs to be switched. And because there's two local crews, they will split up the work between the crews um, on separate switch lists and and throughout the session they're writing out these switch lists so they'll also prioritize it so if stanley like i said wants to be switched by 8 30 those cars may need to be on an earlier switch list um perishables and uh, if you have livestock those are going to be high priority and must be switched immediately and there may be rules in place for that as well that they're done uh, the freight house also has to be spotted early for loading so they need to have empty cars to load up so that they can load those in time for the uh, uh afternoon freight 
Uh, routing and blocking is also a function that is used by the railroad. So when the cars are pulled from the industries, they have to be blocked uh, for the outbound trains. Uh, and it looks like we may be running short on time, so I will try to uh, get through this a little quicker. Um, so for the most part, I don't think car, empty cars were came from town because there wasn't any clean out track. So I think that empty cars were requested and then they came in the overnight trains. But the outbound trains had to be blocked based on um, the rules in this map that the AAR provided. And this is an example from the... Um, arranged freight service books from the New Haven. And it tells you specifically the blocking coming out of New Britain. Uh, there's a block for the speed, which this is all for train Y and one, a block for the speed, which then for Philadelphia transfer, Enola, New London and central Vermont. And then the last block is basically everything else going through Cedar Hill. So when the trains are, uh, the cars are pulled, the um, agent needs to designate where, which blocks those go in so that the crews can, uh, can do that. Um, as they're doing it. Uh, so the switching crews also need to know what the blocking is and, and stuff, but there's no specific order within those blocks. It just has to be in those, those uh, large blocks for the outbound trains. Again, what about a non-switching layout? Um, the local originates with waybills and a wheel report. The wheel report is basically a list of cars in the train. They might have a switch list as well. Um, if they have cars to be spotted on the way, they'll stop at those, but they typically don't stop at industries where they don't have things to drop. And then when they get to their station, um, the agent will provide them uh, waybills and a switch list of any other work that needs to be done in that town. Um, they do the work and so on and continue. If there's a town without an agent, they would have received that prior to reaching that town. Uh, model railroading uh, or modern railroading takes this a step further where there's a centralized office. You typically don't have agents in every town anymore, obviously, um, and the work is assigned by email or radio and or phone. And um, so the crews will know that ahead of time uh, more so than they did in my era. Uh, in my era, you didn't know what work was going to be in a given town until you reached that town. Um, computer programs are typically uh, designed around the movement of cars. Uh, they're designed to randomize the traffic. That's one of the big features. Um, but uh, I want to be able to run the railroad between sessions. And um, I also want to produce prototypical paperwork. Not all of them do that. Uh, most of them don't take into account the AAR car routing rules. And most of them do not provide a proper mix of freight cars. So uh, and by that, I mean the, the rarity of the cars. So, for example, in my era, it's going to be about 60% steel box cars to 40 or 30% single sheath and a few double sheath cars and so on. And so uh, a computer program typically won't do that. So I'm doing a mix of a computer program um, or just a spreadsheet, actually, that randomly determines the car movements. And then I select the appropriate cars so I can take into account the car service rules and a proper mix of cars. Uh, I pull existing waybills that I've already printed from a file cabinet and empty car cards as well and put those around town, um, you know, for the cars in town. And then I build the inbound trains based on those waybills. Um, the spreadsheet doesn't know or care what is where so I can run trains whenever I want without having to worry about maintaining a, a the record or telling the computer where they are. So kind of a quick summary of how this approach is mine. It seems kind of complex and uh, we've had to go through it pretty quickly, but the process on mine is pretty simple. The session runs from 6.15 to 6.30, about 12 hours, uh, using a four to one fast clock. The two agent positions are staggered um, and the two switching crews are staggered. So in the morning, there's crews available to run the through trains. And then in the afternoon, there's different crews available to run the through trains. Um, Stanley Works crew is a single shift, so they will also be available at points during the session to run some of the through trains. Um, I stage the layout by using the spreadsheet. So basically all I do is I tell the spreadsheet how many cars are at each track uh, at an industry or in the yard. I don't even have to specify car numbers or anything. It's just, an, is there a car or not? And the spreadsheet automatically uh, recalculates and randomly tells you how many cars to deliver or pick up at given industries. Some may not receive any, some may not pick up any. Occasionally you'll have too many cars to fit an industry. So it really works very similar to the prototype. 
Um, like I said, I select the way bills from a file cabinet, uh, build trays based on trains based on the routing rules, and select way bills for the outbound loaded cars. So I don't even know what you know the cars are just sitting on the layout, and then while I'm putting together that current session, that's when I'm picking the way bills for the outbound cars, uh, and then I get uh, home route cars for any outbound empties for that session. The train schedule, there's a couple cuts of uh, cars left up by the overnight trains, so those are already waiting for the crews to work. Um, depending on the year, there might be zero to two freights dropping off cars during the morning and then uh, uh, in the evening picking up cars. Um, and then the crews are building cuts of cars that are left for the overnight trains. So it's a very simple process. Passenger traffic is mostly commuter, so it's um, almost all eastbound in the morning, which is convenient because uh, the crews doing the work are going to use track five, which is the westbound, or track one, which is the westbound main if they need to do runaround. So that makes it very simple for them. Um, the agent organizes the waybills, the empty car cards and industry requests and so on, and prioritizes the work. And they write out the switch list and then they classify those outbound cars for those blocks. Uh, the switching crews work from the switch lists. They don't handle waybills at all for the most part. And they pull the cars from the industry. So typically in the morning, what they're doing is they're just going out and pulling cars to make space for the cars they're delivering. And there's a few tracks that are designated for just shoving cars. They're just parked there for the uh, until they're going to classify them later in the afternoon. Um, they then deliver the car from industry. And then they after they've pulled the cars, uh, they block the outbound cars for those afternoon and evening trains. And the Stanley crew interchanges with the New Haven twice a session and more if there's more traffic. They obviously do all the work in Stanley Works. The cars themselves have loading and unloading time. So they'll know the work they need to do, but they need to work, uh, wait until certain times during the day before they can move some of those cars. Uh, they'll also request empties and service from the agent. Um, so that provides more work for the agent during the session. And the through trains themselves operate on a schedule. They're fully staged ahead of time, including the return consists so the power and the cabooses just move to the other ones if it's a freight. Um, they're handled by the off-duty crews. So if you're an agent that's not on duty yet or a switching crew or the, or the Stanley crew and you've uh, finished your shift, then you're running the through trains. Uh, and they just give or take the way bills uh, to the agent or from the agent uh, directly. So uh, they come on to the layout, give them the way bills and then go on. There's not any work that they need to do from that. Otherwise, uh, they just keep the way bills there for the rest of the through freight. So that's that's the basics. Uh, and uh, hopefully we have a little time for answering questions here. And go from there. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Well, Edward wants to know where can one find information about operations from the 1870s? Um, primary sources are going to be your rule books and so on. Uh, one of the interesting things I found when researching this is that even in modern railroading, the rules have not changed very often. Um, I may have some earlier rule books. Uh, eBay is my primary source for finding these things other than train shows, but sometimes libraries have information and paperwork as well, and, and obviously other collectors and stuff. Um, you're welcome to contact me. I've got a number of freight agent rule books, um, station agent books, as well as there are some really good resources um, online. And actually, if you are modeling pre-1922, hathitrust.org, um, as well as Google Books, have tons of books that are scanned. And since those are in the public domain, you're probably going to have an easier time finding things than I will because... Uh, once you get past 1922, they're still copywritten and um, you often can't find the full books online. And um, Andy wants to know, can you not put the car service rules into any computer system? Uh, you can, um, and you can even do um, some uh, variation on it. So there's reports that you can find uh, that show that prior to World War II, for example, car service rules were followed some 80% plus of the time, whereas following World War II, that was much, much less, some cases 20 to 40%. Um, so it depends on how you, much you want to get into the nitty gritty when you're designing a program. 
Uh, I'm not a programmer, so I'm not going to design a program. Um, they were also followed differently. So, for example, the railroads uh, spotting cars or freight houses had a much higher um, level of uh, following the rules than a, 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 an industry that might just empty a car and decide to load it and send it out. So it depends on how much you want to get into that factor. But yes, that is something that could be programmed into a, a program. Sure. And, and learn about all this new crazy paperwork. And as you <laughs> will help you during the session with moving paperwork or changing paperwork. Yep. Uh, my prep work is usually an hour or two. It doesn't take that long to do the uh, initial setup, um, but I'm usually not doing it very quickly either. And I often do it over the course of several nights or whatever. I'll just come down and I'll be, you know, doing stuff on the railroad and, and getting it ready. Um, I do send out a lot of information ahead of time. So people have information ahead of time um, and they can take, I, we usually get started maybe an hour before a session, I, we can uh, get into it. But because the shifts are staggered, I can spend a lot of time with people if they need it ahead of time, while other people who have run the railroad can get to work on it. Um, even new people that have operated in the agent position, it's been fairly self-explanatory once you get through the basics. Um, and I, obviously, I can help with it as well. But that's why I have this uh, concept eventually of having qualified uh, operators. So those will be the ones that will essentially bid on jobs and say, hey, you know, I want to be the agent this time. And, and I'll probably follow some sort of seniority system um, to, to manage that as well. Um, so it doesn't take as much as it seems. It, it really is one of those things that takes far longer to explain it than to show somebody and actually do it. And then last question, what do you do during a session? Uh, I am sort of the person like most of us, if you've ever run operating sessions, you're kind of the troubleshooter. If there's any issues with the railroad, you are um, answering any questions that people have. I uh, will provide work during the session. So like I said, I'm installing a phone system so I can call the agent as an industry saying, okay, I have two cars ready for pickup and they'll provide the information. Uh, they'll write down the information that I'll provide for that. Um, but mostly it's it's the role of the host more than anything else. Um, I tend not to run trains or anything like that during the session. Um, and the person that needs the most help is usually the agent if they're relatively new on the layout. Cool. Well, thank you very, very much for your time. I believe there's still a spin the wheel since Martin showed up. Great. Martin, okay. Ready? okay, let's have a look. Let's let's give the spin the wheel. I reckon this will probably be the last time tonight because it'll. I haven't trained Gordy on how to operate spin the wheel yet. So uh -huh. let's let's transition across to that screen. And uh, okay. We'll get ready and let's see what we come up with this time. Is N scale lost in the hobby? So uh, I, I think that should generate some interest in the chat. Anyhow, um, thanks a million, Randy, uh, for, for your presentation. Yeah, we, thank you guys for having us and uh, and making this possible. Thank you. We 